Well, good morning and Shabbat Shalom and welcome to Congregation Brith Hadashah, those who are here in person and those who are watching us out in TV land on the big screen. Uh, just a joy to have you with us this morning. And I just, uh, just to tell you who we are, we're a congregation comprised of Jewish and non-Jewish believers who believe that Yeshua is the Jewish Messiah. And we worship as such and we gather together because of that. And I always like to open up on Shabbat, anything I do, whether it's home or here, with something that has to do with creation. And I'd like to read Psalm 148. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him from the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all stars of light. Praise him, highest heavens and the waters that are above the, the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. He has also established them forever and ever. He has made a decree which will not pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, sea monsters and all depths, fire and hail, snow and clouds, stormy wind fulfilling his word, mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, beasts and all cattle, creeping things and winged fowl, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes of all judges of the earth, both young men and virgins, old men, and children praise the Lord. I always like doing that because it's Shabbat and the whole world recognizes him, not only on Shabbat but every day. We come together on Shabbat so we're joining in with everything he created in a pre and telling how great he is. And When you look at creation, it's so tactile. You could see it, you could smell it, you could touch it, you could feel it, you could feel it under your feet and it's such a very kind act by the Lord. So today we gather before him on this Shabbat and just tell him how great he is, how beautiful he is, and how grateful we are for his presence. And we praise him along with this psalm. Lord, we just thank you today for your blessing, Lord. We just pray for your presence to fill us. We pray, Lord God, that we could just take this time this morning to enjoy you, to see you in each other, and to hear your word, Lord God, and to open our hearts and to bring it before your altar and to let it change us, Lord. Let your word change us. We pray, Lord God, for all the things you have planned for us, and we are grateful for you giving us this congregation, this place of worship, and let us honor you today in it, in Yeshua's name. How goodly are your tents, O Jacob, your dwelling places, O Israel. As for me, through your great kindness, I will enter your house and bow down to the sanctuary of your holiness in awe of you. <coughs> o Lord, I love the shelter of your house and the place of the residence of your glory. I will prostrate myself and bow. I will kneel before the Lord, my maker. By my prayer to you, Hashem, be offered at a time that is favorable. O oh God, in the abundance of your kindness, answer me with the truth of your salvation. Ma -to Please have a seat. The cycle of life is wonderful in some ways and painful in many other ways. It is marked by victory and failure and it is marked by joy and grief. This life of ours is sometimes more beautiful than can be imagined and yet also so empty and perplexing without knowing the God that conceived it and can make sense of it. The book of Ecclesiastes describes life as vanity and grasping after the wind. It also says that there's a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn 
and a time to dance, a time to gain and a time to lose. There is also, by the way, a time to be young and a time for older years in the joy of grandchildren, but it is also a time to endure the pain of losing those one loves. In Proverbs 15, it says, A glad heart makes a cheerful face, but by sorrow of heart the spirit is crushed. The Bible is replete with individuals that experience joy and pain in their lifetimes, as in Leah, who was overshadowed by her husband's love for Rachel, but her importance was only later acknowledged when she knew that she would be buried next to him. While Joseph, who was betrayed by his brothers but was elevated to sit in power, second only to Pharaoh, and then saved his siblings from famine. Similarly, our Messiah, who was rejected by his own siblings and his own people, but saved many through the shedding of his own blood and sat at the right hand of the Father. And Moses, who was repeatedly spurned by some of his people, but led Israel towards the promised land. Similarly, our Messiah, who was rejected, but will lead us to our promised land, which is heaven, and will lead Israel under his reign in the millennial kingdom. While for Hannah, her heartache in not having a child was overcome with the joy of giving birth to Samuel, the first of six children. And David's joy over his friendship with Jonathan, who saved his life while King Saul hunted him down. Jonathan refused to be his rival over the throne, and when he died, David was deeply distressed over the loss of his friend. And Rabbi Shaul's remorse over those whom he brought to their deaths, and his joy over those whom he brought to a believing faith. So life is beautiful, perplexing, filled with pain and joy, and is at times more overwhelming than any of us can handle. But what was, it, but what was life like for our Messiah when he was on earth? He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, was he not? And there were three specific verses in the scriptures regarding our Messiah's tears. The first one was when he cried over his people, which is the lost sheep of Jerusalem. And secondly, he wept over his beloved friend, Lazarus. And thirdly, it is found in the book of Hebrews, chapter 5. In the days of his life on earth, Yeshua offered up both prayers and pleas with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. The prayer is, is not to save himself from a physical death, as that was our Messiah's mission in coming to earth. It is a prayer that he would fulfill his purpose on earth in order that he would not endure a spiritual death with the eternal consequences for the world. But there is not one mention in the scriptures of our Messiah's laughing or even smiling. Not a single verse. Why? Perhaps because he often surveyed this world that he entered as a disappointed parent. He who created the world saw pain in the world and felt the pain. Our Messiah saw a lost people without the ears to hear nor heart to follow. Later, those whom he loved would forsake him. But it was Lazarus whom he loved that he would bring back to life, as one day he would bring eternal life to all of us whom he loves. Life was never supposed to be this way. Adonai created the world to commune with him, a world of order, one without death. But because of sin, our Messiah, in coming to this earth, found a dying world bereft of a love for God, nor a love for one's neighbor. As well, God found a world led by leaders more interested in their own self-righteousness 
Their desire was to have power to judge others, and their pleasure was to constantly judge our Messiah. Yeshua didn't follow their rules, so he didn't act like one of them. Our Messiah was more interested in healing bodies and spirit, but the Pharisees and Sadducees were more interested in controlling everyone else's minds and spirit. While on earth, our Messiah thought of joy only in future terms. Hebrews 12, focusing on Yeshua, the initiator and perfecter of faith, for the joy set before him. He endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and he has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. And this brings us to the day of the Lord, when there will be a, apocalyptic times for those who resist our God, but it is joy for those who know him. God will restart life's clock, redeeming life and bringing about the world that God had originally planned for us. In heaven, there will no longer be pain. <clears throat> In heaven, there will no longer be pain or death or loss of any kind. But there will be constant communion with God. On earth, Israel will lead the world from Jerusalem as an example of righteousness while our great God sits upon his throne. And look at the words of Zephaniah. Adonai, your God, is in your midst, a mighty Savior. He will delight over you with joy. He will quiet you with his love. He will dance for joy over you with singing. <clears throat> this, this will be the moment in eternity where in the cycle of life, of life no longer feels like an endless masquerade where joy was for a moment, but loss was a never-ending pain. It is instead the eternal moment. <laughs> it is instead the eternal moment in which God smiles upon us, and we who are his children return the smile with great joy. Glory Please join with me in the prayer for Israel from Isaiah 43. But now thus says the Lord, your creator, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. I love that statement because it's a, it's a unique connection between man and God. Um, naming something, calling somebody by name, giving it a name, uh, almost brings a, a covenant relationship into play with it. Not almost, it actually does. And God is not random in who he selects and who he calls and who he's going to love and who he's going to redeem. And he is very specific here. And I would just like to pray into that. Lord, your God, we just thank you for your word. We just thank you, Lord, that you're not just distant, sitting off hoping that your people will come to you, Lord. These are your people. You have stated it, Lord. They are yours. You have called them by name. It's not a name the enemy has given them. It's not a name the world has given them. It's the name you have given them, Lord, like a parent naming their firstborn. It's, they are yours, Lord God. And I pray, Lord God, um, that not only will this world come to recognize that, that the enemies of Israel, that the nations will come to recognize that, Lord. I pray that they will, uh, that they will see, and through Israel, through Israel's turning to you, they will know, and they will turn to you as well. Pray for your people, Lord God, this nation uh, who you are not done with, Lord God, this nation who you wait on that roof and look for your son to come running down that road toward you, and like the prodigal, leap off the roof and run, and you can't stop kissing them, Lord God. We pray that you would wrap that robe around them, Lord God, put that ring on their finger, Lord God. We pray that you will bring healing to this nation and blessing and protection, that you will move within her streets, within her hearts, of every, every man, woman, and child who is there and who is spread around the world. 
We pray, Lord God, for that recognition of who you are, the creator of the universe, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Let your children turn to you, Lord God. Lord, this is the most important thing, Lord. It's not about the nations or politics or the culture, Lord God. It's about your children coming under your covering and under your roof again. Lord God, let them run to you the way you run to them. Let them fill your arms around you, Lord God. Let them restore the things of you in their culture and in their lives. As you call them by name, let them come home to you. In Yeshua's name, amen. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu velohe avoteinu Elohe Avraham Elohe Yitzchak velohe Yaakov Ha El Hagadol Hagibor vehanora El Elyon Gomel Chasadim Tovim Vekone hakol vezoche chaste avot ume viko elivne benehem leman chemobiava melech hose umoshiach umagen baruchata adonai magen avraham atagi bole lam adonai Nechaye metim ata rav lehoshia. Mechalkel chayim bechesed. Mechaye metim berachamim rabim. So mech noflim verofe cholim. Umatir asurim. Umekayehem emunatoho. The shane of Mika Mocha Baal Givu wrote, Umi Domelach Melech me me to Mechaye, Umat me a Yeshua, Vene Manata, the Hachayo would meet him, Bochata Adonai. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, and God of our fathers, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and God of Jacob, God who is great, mighty, and awesome. You bestow loving kindness and create all things. Who recalls the patriarch's love for you and brings a redeemer to the children of their children for the sake of your name? O King, helper, redeemer, and shield, Blessed are you, O Lord, shield of Abraham. You are mighty forever. You call the dead to immortal life. You are mighty to save. You sustain the living with kindness, and in great mercy call the dead to everlasting life. You support the fallen. You heal the sick. You release the confined, and keep faith with those that sleep in the dust. Who is like unto you, O master of mighty deeds? And who is comparable to you, O king? who decrees death and restores life and makes sprout salvation, and faithful you to revive the dead. Blessed are you, O Lord, who revives the dead. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Baruch Shem Kivod Malchuto Leolam vahed. Vihavta et Adonai elohecha. Behol of Avcha, Ucho nafshecha, Ucho meodecha. Vahayu had varim haeda. Ashir onochim mitzavcha hayom alvevacha. Vishinan tam livinacha. Vidibart bam. Vishiftacha bevitacha. Uvlechtacha vaderach. Uvshach pecha uvkamacha. Ukshatam liot al yedecha. Vahu le tot of vot beine necha, Uchtav tam almazazot betecha o Hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. 
Blessed be the name of his glorious majesty forever and ever. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your means. And these words which I command you today shall be upon your heart. Teach them diligently to your children, and talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk on the road, when you lie down, and when you rise up. Bind them for a sign upon your hand, and for frontlets between your eyes. Write them upon the doorposts of your house, and upon your gates. If you could be seated, we're going to prepare for the message today. And um, I'd like to just extend your hands and pray over our brother as he is about to bring forth God's word. Lord God, we just thank you for this man, Lord, and uh, for the heart you've given him, Lord, and for the heart you've filled. We just thank you that your presence is with him, Lord, and we pray your anointing and blessing on his words today, on his mind, on his tongue, your peace to be over him, Lord God, and we just thank you for the privilege of hearing your word. Lord, he's bringing something sacred and holy, something from your heart, he's bringing it to us. So we just pray, Lord God, as he, uh, he's, he delivers your mail today. Lord, as he uh, represents you, Lord, open our hearts to learn what you have for us through him, Lord God. Bring your peace over him and everything he loves, Lord God. He's got some exciting days coming up ahead, Lord, and just pray your joy to be with him. Bless him today and bless us through his words in Yeshua's name. Amen. Michael, thank you very much for your humbling and sincere prayers. You know, and I want to make, make mention to Saul, when you were giving your midrash moment, you know, something that you said really touched my heart. You know, many of you already know that two weeks ago in one day, I lost my older sister. And it's been a, a struggle, you know, since then. And I, there was an outpouring of love from this congregation that really touched my heart and I know touched Barbara's heart. My wife is grieving very intensely. She really devoted herself to drawing near to my sister to minister to her in her years of failing health. And she, as I see it, has been struggling so Keep her and my brother-in-law, Bill, Bill Gund, lifted up, if you would, and pray. Pray for them as much as you pray for anything. Bill um, was the caretaker for my sister for seven years through her declining health and devoted his life and retired early so that he could spend more time with her. Uh, too as well so I mean I know he has a void in his life right now in the absence of my sister as well so but saw what you said you said you know where there's good there's bad you know where there's a measure of Taurus there's a measure of Nachas so in three weeks I'm going to be holding my first grandson so on the heels of losing my sister, you know, I have another little guy. You know, I hit four of them, and now I'll have another one. So grand, they say grandchildren are parents' revenge on their children. So it looks like he's going to be a very active little boy. And I say, oh, that's terrible, Josh. You know, you, you were quite active, too. So anyways, I just wanted to get that out there. You know, when preparing for a message, you know, you set aside the date and then you think <laughs> and you contemplate and you research and you think, you know, what does God want me to, to say? And there's usually, you know, a number of different ways that a message can go, but the hardest part is, is zeroing in on what you feel right in your heart that God has stored up for you. So what I've done for today's message is basically drawn it centrally from today's parsha, which is shalach lecha, or send for yourselves. 
It's the story of the, the 12 spies that went south to north and north to south, east to west in Israel for 40 days and 40 nights, and came back with a report on the land that Moses had uh, asked them to give. And I believe that their report about the land was, was good, it was good and encouraging but they lost heart and something very unfortunate happened, you know, with the bad report. And we'll talk more about this, but I'm just giving you a summary. You know, uh, the bad report that was issued by them multiplied. It's like mob mentality, you know, going with the flow of the crowd and not thinking for yourselves. So, you know, that's one of the points that I, you know, want to, to make. And I guess if I could just give a summary of the message, and you don't remember anything but this, it is to know that God is always there, he's always available, and always willing to help us to face down any and even all of our fears during our lifetimes. And that today's the message I'm going to be giving today hopefully will be a view of how we should speak well and how we should listen better and examine the power of spoken blessings in our life and in the life of the Kehilo and to avoid with all our hearts, all mind and strength, avoiding the Shanhara, which at all in our actions uh, with others. But I can't give a message without first telling some Jewish mother jokes. So I hope you all will suffer with me. I know Peter, Peter's shaking his head. A Jewish man calls his mother in Florida. Mom, how are you? Not too good, says the mother. I've been very weak. The son says, why are you so weak? She says, because I haven't eaten in 38 days. The son says, that's terrible. Why haven't you eaten in 38 days? The Jewish mother answers, because I didn't want my mouth filled with food should my son finally call. <laughs> Saw like that. <laughs> Is that a good one? Yeah. A Jewish boy comes home from school and tells his mother he's been given a part in the school play. Wonderful, what part is it? The little boy says, I play the part of the Jewish husband. The mother scowls and says, go back and tell the teacher you want a speaking part. Why do Jewish mothers make great parole officers? Because they never let anyone finish a sentence. <laughs> All right, this, this one deviates a little, but it's, just, it's still funny. It's called a matter of life and death. A rabbi and a priest are the lone passengers on a plane. Suddenly, the plane's engines cock out. Immediately, the priest grabs the only parachute and jumps out. The pilot asks the rabbi, how will you survive? The rabbi answers, don't worry about me. The priest took my talus bag by mistake. <laughs> okay. All right, I'll close with this. This is a little longer, but I think you'll like it. It's called The End. Moshe had just had a medical checkup. I hate to be the one to break it to you, said the doctor, but you've only got about six months to live. Oh my goodness, gasped Moshe, turning white. A few minutes later, after the news had sunk in, Moshe said, Doctor, you've known me a long time. Do you have any suggestions as to how I can make the most of my remaining months. The doctor asked, have you ever married? 
Moshe replied that he had been a bachelor his whole life. The doctor said, you might think about taking a wife. After all, you'll need someone to look after you during the final illness. That's a good point, said Moshe. And with only six months to live, I better make the most of my remaining time. May I make one more suggestion, asked the doctor. Marry a Jewish girl. A Jewish girl? Why? asked Moshe. The doctor said, it'll seem longer. <laughs> so I like that one. <laughs> Okay, that's enough. <laughs> Anyways, I've titled my message, The Good Report Versus the, the Bad Report, A Spy Story. And I have ba the text for my message is taken from Numbers 14, 1 through 9, where it talks about the rebellion of the people and what took place. So let's do our Torah blessings, and then we'll read. Baruch Hu et Adonai Hamvorach, Baruch Adonai Hamvorach Le'elam Va'ed, Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Olam, Asher Bachar Banu Mikohamim, V'natan Lanu et Tarato, Baruch Ata Adonai, Notain ha Torah. Amen. Numbers 14, 1 through 9. That night, all the people of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole assembly said to them, If only we had died in Egypt or in this desert. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it have been better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, We should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell face down in front of the whole Israelite assembly gathered there. Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had explored the land, tore their clothes and said to the entire Israelite assembly, the land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not be afraid of the people of the land because we will swallow them up. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech olam Asher natan lanu Torah emet V'chaye olam natah betuchenu Baruch atah Adonai Notein ha Torah Amen. You may be seated. Let us now begin a spy story. Isn't there something that is uniquely intriguing about the mystery that gathers around a good spy story, a good yarn that just plain old gets your interest? You may have read spy stories by Tom Clancy, Lynn Dayton, Robert Ludlum, just to name a few famous spy writers. Well, today, what we're going to do is to look at the first spy yarn that is recorded in the Bible. It might not be a story that is jam-packed, with the technical sophistication and graphic action of modern espionage, but there is nonetheless a mystery and an intrigue attached to the story of Moshe sending out the 12 spies to check out the land of Canaan. 
One man from each of the 12 tribes was chosen to be a spy, to go to the land, and each was a leader in his own right and given the important task of surveillance. They were 12 men who, without a doubt, were chosen because of their personal suitability for the task, men of intelligence, and men of courage, leaders in each of the 12 tribes, and recognized as such. So 12 men were sent out for 40 days as sufficient time for them to make their reconnaissance and then come back and report directly to Moshe. Twelve men sent out as a company, drawing from each other mutual support and protection. The twelve were sent to check out the inhabitants of the land. Were they strong or weak? Were they few or many? The twelve were sent to check out the countryside, whether the land was good or bad. The twelve were sent to see whether the inhabitants of the land lived in tents or did they live in walled cities. The twelve had to assess whether the land was productive or unproductive. Well, the spies saw these things and reported back to Moses. What they saw in Canaan was that everything was on a grand scale. And this is what they reported to Moses. The people and the produce of the land was nothing like what they had seen or known up until that time. It's a good thing the spies aren't here to look at all the food that Pam has. What would they report? They'd say, good job. Imagine, if you will, a cluster of grapes needing to be carried by two men on a pole. Imagine a people that dwarfed others, viewed as giants that made other human beings feel that they were mere insects, grasshoppers. The land of Canaan was beyond their comprehension. It was larger than life, if you like. The land was good. The people seemed strong. The cities were walled, and many people populated the place. However, to say the least, the spies were overwhelmed by what they saw. Remember that God had already promised and provided the promised land to the people of Israel. He brought them out of the land of Egypt with many mighty miracles, signs, and wonders, of which they witnessed, they saw. God had led them to the verge of entrance into the land that he promised to give to them unequivocally and delivered. However, among the 12 spies, only two, Joshua and Caleb, came back saying that through God, they could indeed conquer and possess the land. The other 10 spies brought a large dose of negativity, discouragement, apprehension, and fear, also known as the bad report. We could call it the discolored report. What they reported about the land was factual. All the facts were given to Moses, and then they tried to influence everyone. They said that they could not possess the land that God had promised and given to them because of the giants living there. They must have seen my sons. <laughs> this evil report discouraged the people and produced a rebellion that prevented that generation from taking possession of Canaan. Their confidence in God's promise and assistance was utterly shaken, 
and their unbelief prevented any such attempt to take possession of the land as would otherwise have been made with complete success. The bringing up of the evil report, as it's come to be known, by those who are sent to search and their failing to encourage and lead forward the people were the means of that generation being turned back and eventually totally wasted in the wilderness. They were 10 days away, and 10 days became 40 years. God was so incensed against them for their lack of confidence in his help and of his power and desire to give them possession that he swore in his wrath that they should not enter into his rest. And the people, with two totally different reports, two disparate reports before them, were filled with unbelief and discouragement and chose to believe the ten spies that postulated this evil report. God had promised them the land and had provided everything possible for them to enter in and to enjoy all of his provision. They refused to believe God and died in disobedience while in the wilderness over the upcoming 40 years. They believed that taking the land would be an impossible task. For each of us, have you ever thought that something was impossible? Yes, we all do. Ever thought that things could be different, but were afraid to do something about it? The majority of the spies felt the pressure of not being able to face up to their fears and to their anxieties. And on this score, we can easily identify with the spies, can't we? Time and time again, perhaps in our own trials, testings, and tribulations, we too fail to face up to our fears and to our own personal anxieties. While the majority of the spies caved in, caved in to the challenge that was before them, a minority, a very small minority, felt and acted very differently. One of the spies, Caleb, challenged the children of Israel. He implored them. It's recorded in Numbers 14, 7 through 10. The land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord, and do not be afraid of the people of the land, because we will swallow them up. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. He was basically calling them out and saying to them, sure, there are obstacles, but we can do it with God's help. Caleb did not diminish the difficulty of invading the land of Canaan, but he knew that the victory would be Israel's because God was with them. God makes all the difference to any difficulty that needs to be overcome, even in our own lives, and that's what we need to remember. Unfortunately, Caleb's desire to proceed was overruled by the other spies. The people of God listened to the pessimism of the ten spies, unfortunately. And that raises the question for us personally, how often do we listen to the voice of pessimism rather than the voice of optimism? Right now, do you listen to any negativity around about you? Or do you, or do you strive to heed the more encouraging and positive voice? 
God is always available to help us to face our fears and challenges in life. So let's be like Caleb and go for it. Let's now take a deeper look into the entire spy story and the issue of the vast degree of difference our attitudes can impact in life's circumstances. All of scripture has many references to people of positive attitudes as well as people of negative attitudes. What did the ten spies with the negative report really push out? Well, first and foremost, I feel that they implied that God's word is null and void. Numbers 13, 26 to 29 states, They came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. There they reported to them and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruit. But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Enoch there. The Amalekites live in the Negev. The Hittites, Jebusites, and Amorites live in the hill country. And the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. This is exactly what the spies told Moses, to paraphrase it. We went to the land where you sent us. It is indeed flowing with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. But the inhabitants are strong, and the cities are very fortified and very large. But, 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 but is the third most used conjunction in the English language. We hardly give any serious thought to it. Nevertheless, it's a word to be used with extreme caution because in any language, but often nullifies whatever preceded it. So the spies were actually saying, everything God told you about the land was true, but he lied when he said that it will be ours because there's no way we can conquer it. In fact, the Hebrew word ephes, which can be used in place of but, means it's over. So these ten spies nullified God's word completely. They left camp, certainly, with a spirit of adventure, but despaired after seeing the fortified cities and the inhabitants of Canaan. They failed to rely on God's supernatural ability for they reckoned only on their own natural ability. And this is what Caleb called them out on. This tells us that positive attitudes affirm God's word. Negative attitudes nullify his word. Positive attitudes feed our faith. Negative attitudes feed on our faith faith. God could have pardoned the spies for bringing a negative report. One may argue that it was just human error after all, but the behavior of these spies indicate their actions were far from human error. They were haughty, they were arrogant. Their commission had been to carry out reconnaissance on the target and to report back what they saw factually. Sounds like today's media, doesn't it? Numbers 13, 30, and 31 tells us, Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, We should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. But the men who had got up with him said, We can't attack those people. They're stronger than we are. Well, it wasn't the spies' job to determine if the Israelites could overcome the Canaanites. 
On the, on the other hand, Caleb assured them that they can conquer the land indeed. Caleb was a mighty warrior. He wasn't bluffing. Nevertheless, the spies refused to listen. They insisted that it's impossible to conquer the land. They did not withdraw their opinion, despite Caleb's urging. This tells us that positive, positive attitudes bring assurance and security. Negative attitudes breed haughtiness and arrogance and an unwillingness to listen to reason. Numbers 13, 32, and 33 tells us, and they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. And they did this on their own. They said, the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. This tells us that they struck fear into the congregation of God, and they did it deliberately. The spies suddenly shifted from a negative report to a report of exaggeration, embell embell embellishing in falsehood, evil, and fear. They falsely claimed the land to be infertile and said its inhabitants are cannibals. They deliberately described the tall Anakites as the Nephilim to strike fear into the hearts of the people, shamelessly liken God's people to grasshoppers. This tells us that positive attitudes inspire fear of God in us. Negative attitudes strike fear of circumstances into our hearts. So we ask the question, what was the effect of fear on the people? They rebelled. Numbers 14, 1 through 4 tells us, that night all the people of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole assembly said to them, if only we had died in Egypt or in this desert. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. So they murmured against God and Moshe. Sadly, it may seem that the rest of the people in the camp were innocent victims, but they were not. They made a deliberate decision to exchange the truth for the lies of men, despite the fact that God had just proved his supernatural power to them three times since they left Sinai. The Bible says the entire camp wept that night and murmured against Moses and Aaron. This act of murmuring was far more than complaining or grumbling. It was more like a parliamentary vote of no confidence because they no longer trusted their leaders and wished to choose a new leader and go back to Egypt. They daringly accused God for not permitting to allow them to die in Egypt or in the wilderness, only to bring them to a foreign land to fall by the sword and for their families to be ravaged. I think this tells us that positive attitudes help us sort the truth from the lies. Negative attitudes cloud our judgment. And then the people rebelled against their leaders. Then Moses and Aaron fell face down in front of the whole Israelite assembly gathered there. 
Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, were among those who had explored the land, tore their clothes, and said to the entire Israelite, the entire Israelite community, the land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not be afraid of the people of this land because we will swallow them up. Their protection is gone and the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. But the whole assembly talked about stoning them. They wanted to erase Moses, Aaron, Joshua, and Caleb. Moses and Aaron made every possible effort to convince the people that what they heard was not true. And then they interceded for the nation while Joshua and Caleb reassured God will indeed give them the land. Still these foolish people wouldn't listen. They would have put Joshua, Caleb, Moses, and Aaron to death by stoning them unless the Lord himself had intervened, which he did. This tells us that positive attitudes help us to solve disagreements peacefully, while negative attitudes cause violence and strife. We see it all over the place today. They despised God and his word. The Hebrew word neats used by God in Numbers 14, 11, 23, and 31, means to reject with disdain or with contempt. And I'll just read one of them. In verse 11 of Numbers 14, the Lord said to Moses, how long will these people treat me with contempt? How long will they refuse to believe in me? in spite of all the miraculous signs I have performed for them. It sounds like God's running out of patience, doesn't it? And he says the same thing in verse 23 and then in 31. In what ways did the people despise God? Well, they accused God on the grounds of falsehood and their own ungodly motives. They condemned the land God promised to them as a land of death. They decided to appoint a new leader and go back to Egypt. They willfully and consciously decided to put their own leaders to death. They tempted God for the tenth time since the exodus from Egypt. Consequently, God threatened to destroy everyone except Moses, Aaron, Joshua, and Caleb. But Moses and Aaron pleaded with them and pleaded with God to not destroy his people for the sake of his own glory. God forgave, but pronounced that nobody but Joshua, Caleb, and the children of that generation, all under the age of 20, would live to see the promised land. All others would die in the wilderness as they wandered and walked around in circles for the next 40 years. They were 10 days away. And then he struck down the 10 spies because they were directly responsible for what had happened. Canaan was only a 10 day journey away. Now they had to wait for 40 years. At least it, is says, that it says that it is truly dreadful to fall into the hands of the living God. This tells us also, I think, that positive attitudes 
can convince and can and should convince us to appreciate the blessings that we have. Negative attitudes, however, can bring judgment upon us. This now leads us to our two heroes, Joshua and Caleb. Numbers 14:24. But because my servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly, I will bring him into the land he went to, and his descendants will inherit it. Joshua, Caleb, and the others spied the same land. They saw the same things. And they agreed upon the points that Moses had directly told them to report on. But they had a different spirit. They had a different outlook. They had a different attitude. They essentially did two important things. Number one, they guarded their hearts. They trusted God against all odds. Proverbs 4.23 says, Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. The ten spies managed to influence over a million people but not Joshua and Caleb. They did not underestimate the military power of Canaan. However, they did not underestimate God's power and omnipotence either. Joshua and Caleb trusted God against all odds. So I think that this then tells us that positive attitudes help us to trust God against all odds. Whereas negative attitudes make our hearts vulnerable and prone to despair and giving up. Now let's shift gears a little bit as we move into the home stretch of this morning's message and focus on an important issue, one that led to the collapse of courage suffered by the children of Israel at the hands of the ten spies. And I think we can say that this points to their lack of good listening skills. We know the Israelites came to wrong conclusions for, for several reasons, and I'll name a few and delineate them. Number one, they forgot God's promise. Number two, they focused on their own resources rather than the Lord's. Number three, they left God out of the decision process. Number four, they allowed negative reports to overshadow God's promises. Number five, they forgot God's previous promises and his work in their lives. Number six, they chose to listen wrongly, heeding doubters rather than believers. In other words, they listened carelessly, inappropriately, and incorrectly. Instead of listening carefully, appropriately, and correctly. So it's this last point that I now desire for us to explore together more fully. The Israelites, I think, woefully needed some important lessons in good listening. And I think we do too. Listening is one of the easiest things you will ever do and also one of the hardest. In a sense, listening is easy. It doesn't demand the initiative and energy required in speaking, or does it? True sustained active listening is a great act of faith, emet and chesed, both for ourselves and for others in the kehila, or the body. 
The Israelites needed lessons in both listening and speaking. I'd like to present some pointers that would have certainly helped them. If we could turn the back clock, turn the, the clock back rather, and pretend they're listening. These are just as applicable for us today. So listen well and listen closely. I heard a phone alarm. I was listening, Mike. <laughs> we could subtitle this part of today's message, How to Speak Well and How to Listen Better. There are two sides to every conversation and both are essential to the art of communication. Let's think on these things. Are you a clear talker or do you ramble on and on and on? Are you an attentive listener or do you tend to always interrupt the other person? So, when it's your turn to talk, number one, get your thinking straight, right out of the box. The first rule of plain talk is to think before you say anything. Organize your thoughts. Number two, say what you mean. Say exactly what you mean. Number three, get right to the point. Effective communicators don't beat around the bush. If you want something, ask for it. If you want someone to do something, say exactly what you want done. Number four, be concise. Don't waste words. Confusion grows in direct proportion to the number of words that are being used. So speak plainly, clearly, and briefly using the shortest, most familiar words. Number five, be real. For maximum clarity, be natural and let the real you come through. You'll be more convincing and much more comfortable yourself. Number six, try to speak in images. Give, paint word pictures. The, the words can help people visualize concepts and they can be tremendous aids in communicating a message, what you want to say. And now, when it's your turn to listen, do it with thought and care. Listening, like speaking and writing, requires genuine interest and attention. If you don't concentrate on listening, you won't learn much and you won't remember much of what you do learn. Number two, use your eyes. If you listen only with your ears, you're missing out on much of the message. Good listeners keep their eyes open while listening. Look for feelings. Number three, when you do this, try to observe nonverbal cues and signals as you listen intently with your eyes. Nonverbal signals can give valuable tips on the kind of questions to ask and the kind of answers to be alert for. Number four, make things easy. People who are poor listeners will find few who are willing to come to them with useful information. You just don't want to bother. Good listeners make it easy on those to whom they want to listen. They draw you. They make it clear that they're interested in what the other person has to say. Number five, good listening requires patience. Don't be half-eared with divided attention. Be attentive and patient, externally relaxed, and internally active. Block out distractions, 
and peripheral things that keep streaming into our consciousness. Husbands, when your wife is talking to you, draw close to her and look at her. Look at her and come close. That's something that I, I've learned to do and try to do it. Make the other person feel valuable, that what they're saying is important to you and you're doing everything that you can to understand and to grasp what they're saying. Lastly, let's remember that good, is, good listening is an act of love. Poor listening rejects while good listening embraces. Remember that. Poor listening diminishes the other person while good listening enhances. And good listening asks perceptive questions. Proverbs 18, 2. A fool finds no pleasure in understanding, but delights in airing his own opinions. Proverbs 20, verse 5. The purposes of a man's heart are deep waters, but a man of understanding draws them out. Good listening gently peels the onion and probes beneath the surface. It doesn't interrogate and pry, but draws out and helps point the speaker through careful questions. And remember that good listening is ministry. There will be days when the most important act of avodah we can do is to square our shoulders to some hurting person, uncross our arms, lean forward, make eye contact, and hear their pain all the way to the bottom. I repeat that. Hear their pain all the way to the bottom. And good listening prepares us to speak well. Sometimes good listening only listens and ministers best by keeping quiet. But typically good listening readies us to minister words of grace to precisely the place where the other person is in need. We should listen with the ears of God that we may speak the word of God. And lastly, I think that good listening reflects our relationship with God. Our inability, anyone's inability to listen well to others may be symptomatic of a chatty spirit that is droning out the voice of God. We need to remember that. So finally, the ten spies and eventually the entire nation engaged in what is known as Lashan Hara, or evil tongue. This is the halakhic term for derogatory speech about others. Evil tongue is considered to be a various sin, uh, a very serious sin in the Jewish tradition. And it's reckoned that it should be avoided at all costs. As with the Exodus nation, nation which severely engaged in this, and which led to 40 years of wandering in the wilderness and death. The same holds true for us today. Let us instead always focus on being instruments of blessings in the lives of others, in the kehila and beyond. The entire world is a kehila. So let's meditate on the following, and you don't need to put these all up. I'm going to run through some scripture verses very quickly that reinforce this thought. Psalm 34:13 says, 
Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking guile. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Proverbs 18.20 A man's stomach shall be satisfied from the fruit of his mouth and from the produce of his lips he shall be filled. filled. Isaiah 50, verse 4 The Lord God has given me the tongue of the learned that I should know how to speak a word in season to him who is weary. Proverbs 10, 11. The mouth of the righteous is a well of life, but violence covers the mouth of the wicked. Proverbs 16, 24. Pleasant bones, pleasant words rather, are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul and health to the bones. Proverbs 15, 1. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. The tongue of the wise uses knowledge rightly, but the mouth of fools pours forth foolishness. And then Proverbs 15, 28. The heart of the righteous studies how to answer, but the mouth of the wicked pours forth evil. And lastly, Proverbs 21, 23. Whoever guards his mouth and his tongue keeps his soul from troubles. One of my favorite scripture verses in the Messianic writings is contained in the book of Matthew. And Mike quoted it during Shabbat school, made reference to it. My heart jumped up talking about, contained in Matthew 5, 13 through 16, where Yeshua proclaimed the parable of being salt and light. He said, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Salt is a preservative. If it loses its saltiness, it's no longer good to do what it's function to do. It doesn't preserve. And if and you are the light of the world, you're engendered, you're you're encouraged to let your light shine. Why? The light overcomes the darkness and the light fills the whole house. So everyone who lives there benefits from being in the light rather than the darkness. So let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. When you let your light shine, it allows other people to see what you do and give, gives praise to the author of faith and our lives. So to sum it all up, You're saying, Ellen, you said to be concise. (laughs) And I use a lot of words. Well, I'm going to sum it up. Good listening may be one of the hardest things we learn to do, but we will find it worth every ounce of effort of which we invest into it. So we'll seek to live our lives like Joshua 
in Caleb and not to allow ourselves to be come to come into the reign of the ten spies will be the will be the good report and not the evil report and that's it <laughs> The Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you are to bless the, the Israelites. Say unto them, Shalom. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give to you his peace. And so they will put my name upon the Israelites, and I, the Lord, will bless them. Bisham Yeshua HaMashiach Adonino, in the name of Yeshua, our Messiah King. And soon may he return. Amen. Shabbat Shalom. Give him praise.